man was held a captive by satan listen to this amazing redemption story as we discover how jesus christ ransomed the entire human race and set us free i want to take a few moments just to talk to us about this season that we are in the time that we take on good friday to remember Christ's death for us on the cross and this Easter Sunday when we remember that and celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ rose up from the dead one of the words that describe all of these things that we are celebrating thinking about is the word ransom and so our theme for this whole easter celebration is ransomed and i want to take a few moments just to talk about that bring our thoughts to focus on a few things and then we're going to pray together when we talk about the word ransom many of us usually picture in our mind uh, somebody who's strong who is powerful holding somebody else as captive and then demanding a price demanding something to be paid typically it could be cash uh, in other situations it could be some other kinds of demands that that they make and saying that they would not release the person or the individuals whom they are holding captive until that price has been paid and we refer to that as the ransom the price of redemption the price to purchase the freedom of a captive is what we refer to as ransom or redemption price now the lord jesus in matthew the 20th chapter the 28th verse he said this he said talking about himself he said the son of man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many so the lord jesus is saying i've come with this purpose i've come to give my life as a ransom for many people the apostle paul later writing in first timothy chapter 2 verses 5 and 6 he writes he says there is one god and there is one mediator between god and men the man Christ Jesus who gave his life as a ransom for many to be testified in due time to be proclaimed or announced at the right time and that's what we are doing this morning we are proclaiming we are announcing the fact that the lord jesus christ came to give his life as a ransom for many there is one god and there is one mediator between god and men the man christ jesus who gave his life as a ransom so i want us to consider why did the lord jesus christ have to give his life as a ransom we're talking about life for life it's not money it's not wealth it's not a set of rules it's not a formula it's not a religion he's saying he gave his life why would he have to give his life as a ransom and we want to understand how he did it and what would that mean to you and me today sitting here this morning to understand this we go to the bible and we journey back to the very beginning the bible tells us that when god created adam and eve the first man and woman he created them in his own likeness in his own image and he placed them on this earth giving them authority rulership dominion and ownership of this earth so great was the authority and dominion that god had vested in man the bible says that the earth the entire earth the dominion of this earth was given to man sometimes we cannot understand we cannot grasp the significance of adam's role or on the earth 
which God had appointed for his life. So Adam had complete dominion on this earth. But his dominion on this earth was dependent on his obedience to God, on his submission to his heavenly father, his creator God. It was connected. His authority flowed through his submission. If he violated that submission to God, if he violated that obedience, that place of obedience, his authority on the earth would be forfeited. God had said, do not commit one sin. One sin. Because that will violate your submission to me. Unfortunately, as the Bible, as the story in the Bible unfolds, Adam and Eve were deceived by Satan. They fell into sin, into disobedience. And in so doing, Adam committed high treason. All the authority, all the dominion, all the ownership, all the rulership that God had vested in his man. This man now committing high treason forfeited that and gave it to Satan. That's why the Bible says. In many places refers to Satan as the God of this world. It calls him the prince of this world. The ruler. Thank you guys. It calls him the ruler of this world. The God of this world. And if you remember when the Lord Jesus was tempted. In one of those three temptations. Satan told Jesus. He said. All this authority. I will give you because it has been given to me. It has been given to me. And Jesus never disputed Satan's claim of having ownership of all of this earth. So when Adam sinned, the Bible tells us through sin, through one man's disobedience, sin came into this world. And death through sin and death passed over all men because all have sinned. But only, not only was there a sin issue and a death issue, but there was a Satan issue. Through one man's disobedience, sin came into this world, death through sin. But also Satan came in and he gained rulership, ownership, authority, dominion over Adam's race. So the entire human race was plunged into a position of oppression, in a position of being controlled and dominated by Satan. And through his disobedience, Adam created a debt for himself. This debt was in heaven, the debt of sin, the debt of rebellion against God. And Satan had a legal claim, a legal hold on the entire human race. Some of us would question, you know, why God being God, why couldn't he just step in and tell Satan, more of the way, old boy, these are my people. Why didn't God do that? I mean, he's God after all. He's the boss. He's in charge. Why didn't he just kick the devil out of the way and say, stop troubling the human race? Why didn't he do that? you got to understand that when God delegated authority to Adam and Eve, he really meant it. It was not a fake delegation. It was a genuine thing. When God said, I'm placing my man, Adam, and my people, Adam and Eve, and they have ownership. God meant it. He would respect that. And so when Adam and Eve decided to place that, transfer that authority, so to speak, To the hands of Satan, God would not violate that. And so, the entire human race was plunged into subjection to sin, to wickedness, to slavery, to Satan. And we had an unpaid debt in heaven. The judiciary of heaven demanded... That every sin had to be paid for. And the Bible says the payment for sin is death. 
By debts, we don't mean just physical debt, although that's included. But by debt, we are talking about the payment for sin, which is eternal separation from God in hell. God is perfectly, completely, and infinitely holy. And not even one stain of sin has the right to be in his presence. So every man by default was born in sin, born subject to Satan, and had to be eternally separated from God in hell. That was not God's original design, but it was a consequence of Adam's disobedience. So here was the problem. One man sold the entire human race to sin and to subjection to Satan. Therefore, it would require a man to bring it back. God would not step in and do it because he had delegated authority to man. If man released it, a man had to go back and get it back. A man had to go and get it back. God himself, being almighty God, wouldn't just come in and tell the devil to get out of the way. But the problem was more complex than that. It didn't, it didn't just mean that any man could go and get it. But there was a requirement for this man. First of all, this man had to be untainted by sin. Sin should never have stained his life. Only then would he even begin to qualify to stand before Satan and say, give me this authority back. Secondly, this man should never, even for a single moment, have let Satan have the upper hand over his life. He should, be a, he should have been a man who lived every moment above Satan. But on both these counts, there was not one single human person who could qualify. There have been many great men and women who have lived on this earth. Many noble, many pious, many great teachers, many great philosophers. Even many who have lived remarkably, remarkably well who've lived noble lives and done great deeds, but yet they all fail on both these counts. The Bible says that there is no one who is righteous, not even one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And every man born of Adam's race was automatically born subject to Satan. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 19, that the whole world lies in the grip of the wicked one. The Bible says that all of us are walking according to the prince of this world. According to the spirit of disobedience that is at work in every human person. So every man, every woman born of Adam was born in sin and born subject to Satan. Only a sinless man, only a man or a woman born above sin and above Satan could even qualify. And then thirdly, they had to pay the price. What was the price? What was it that enabled Satan to have a legal hold on the human race? It was the unpaid debt of sin in the judiciary of heaven. Sin had to be paid for by death. And the only way death can, it, we can indicate that death has taken place is through the shedding of blood. And the Bible tells us in Leviticus 17 verse 11 that without the shedding of blood... There is no atonement for sin. And that's why blood becomes important. Because when blood is shed, it is indicative that a life has been given. Death has occurred. A life has been given. So now sin can be atoned for. So blood is very important. So this sinless person, this person who would have lived about Satan, would then be qualified to pay the price of blood and death. Atone for our sins and thereby break Satan's legal hold on the human race. But unfortunately, there was not one single person available. Where could this person, who could this person be and where could such a person come from? 
And none of us could have done it for ourselves. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 49, verses 6, and eight, verse 6 through 8, he says, Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. Who could bring what offering for the ransom of a soul? The Bible says there in verse 8, for the redemption of their souls is costly. It's priceless. It is beyond what anything earth could afford. No amount of gold, no amount of wealth, no amount of riches, no amount of sacrifice, no amount of religious doings, no amount of piety, no amount of pilgrimages, nothing on this earth could purchase the ransom or the redemption of our souls. It was that expensive. Nothing. Or Jesus put it like this in Mark chapter 8, verse 37. He said, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? So, there was only one solution. Only one. God had to become a man. God had to come not as God in all his power. That would be unfair. That would be violating what he already established. He had to come in the finiteness of a human body. While he was still God, he had to walk as a complete human body. Being. And he had to fulfill these two requirements. He had to be perfectly untainted by sin. Live a perfectly sinless life. And he had to live above Satan. And this is the story of the Bible. That God became a man. And this God who became man is Jesus Christ. Now Jesus came into this world. The Bible says he was tempted in every way like every man living in this world of wickedness and sin. He was untainted by sin. Sin had no entrance in his life. He lived above Satan. Jesus said, the ruler of this world is coming, but he has no place in me. No place above Satan. He spoke to us about the things of God. He taught us about his realm, his kingdom. And he demonstrated the works of God. What a life would be like if somebody lived victorious over sin and Satan. Here are things you could do. He cast out demons. He healed the sick. He released and demonstrated the miraculous power of God. He said, look, this is it. This is what you were supposed to be, do, you could do when you're walking with God. He demonstrated that to us. But most importantly, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross. Inasmuch as the pain and the suffering was significant. There was something more greater than his physical suffering. On the cross, that huge unpaid debt in heaven, which you owed, which I owed, which every human person who ever lived or would ever live, that entire debt was laid upon him. And the penalty of that was put upon Jesus Christ on the cross. So that's why the Bible says, He became the payment for our sins. And not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to our own sinful ways. But the Lord has laid on him the sins of us all. 
the sins of the whole world. The unpaid debt in heaven that you owe, that I owed, was put upon Jesus. So the blood he shed on Calvary's cross was not just the physical flow of blood. It was the ransom. It was the redemption price being paid for you and for me and for every person who lived or would ever live. So Jesus died on the cross. He was buried. Three days later, he rose up again. The Bible tells us he showed himself alive to his disciples. He continued on this earth for 40 days where he showed, where he appeared to more than 500 eyewitnesses. So there was unquestionable, it was infallible proofs that this Jesus had indeed been raised up from the dead. If you bring 500 eyewitnesses to any court, the case will be cleared. No more questions. 500 eyewitnesses who saw him alive for those 40 days and he ascended into heaven. But then you and I would ask this question, why would God do this? Why would the eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God stoop to such a level of becoming a finite human being Containing himself in, in a finite body. Why would he do this? There's only one reason. Because of love. On, because of love. Christ's death on the cross. Was a display of God's immeasurable love for you. For me. This might seem so simple, but yet it is so weighty. There is a God in heaven who loves you. Who loves you. So on the cross when Jesus died, our sins were paid. The curse was removed and Satan was defeated. His hold on the human race was forever broken through that sacrifice. I want you to think this with me. God being God would succeed the first time he did it. God would not need five attempts or ten attempts or fifteen attempts to save the human race. If he needed that many, he was flawed and he wouldn't be God. So in one incarnation, in one coming into this world, one time, he took care of the entire problem. The second thing, there is no more sacrifice that you and I need to make. He paid it all. So today, God is not asking you to go on a pilgrimage. He's not asking you to pay so much money. He's not asking you to make such and such sacrifice. Nothing is needed. It's been paid in full. It's done. It's done. I want you to consider a few scriptures and then we're going to pray. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12. Not with the blood of bulls and goats. That means it was not with the blood of animals. But with his own blood. He entered into the most holy place. Having obtained eternal redemption for us. So Jesus carried his own blood. Walking before that unpaid debt that was there against you, your name and against my name in the court of heaven. He said, my blood has paid it all. Not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood. He entered that most holy place. 
and he canceled your debt. With your debt being canceled in heaven, Satan on earth has no more legal claim over you and me. No more. The debt's been paid. First Peter chapter 1 verses 18 and 19, the Bible says, For you were redeemed not with corruptible things as gold and silver, but with the precious blood of Christ. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. All the silver, all the gold in this world would never have been able to pay this debt. Jesus Christ paid it with his own blood. So here is the beautiful thing. He has commissioned us to go announce the good news to the whole world. And everyone who believes in Jesus, who takes up this option, who chooses to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and say, yes, I believe in this God who came into this world, who died for my sin, who rose up again, who's alive, who says he can freely forgive my sin. I believe in him. The Bible says that if you make Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior, he ransoms you. He brings you out of the powers of darkness and he translates you into his own kingdom. Listen to Colossians 1 verses 13 and 14. Paul the apostle writing to the believers, people who have believed in Jesus Christ, he announces to them, he has delivered you from the dominion of darkness, from the power of darkness. That means Satan has no more legal claim over your life. He has no more authority over you. Because this Jesus has delivered you from the power of darkness. And he has translated you into his own kingdom. Kingdom of his own dear son. In whom we have redemption. We have been ransomed. The price for our freedom has been paid. And we have the forgiveness of our sins. So everyone who believes in Jesus Christ... The Bible says experiences this transfer. Which means Satan has no more claim over your life. Sin's dominion over you is broken. You are redeemed. So Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20. You were bought with a price. You were bought. You now become God's purchased possession. You now become the ransomed of the Lord. God paid the price. He ransomed you. You become his possession. The devil has no more claim over your life. You've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit because now they belong to God. You can stand and tell the devil, devil, you can't touch my body. You can't touch anything of me. My spirit, soul, or body. I'm ransomed. I'm the redeemed of the Lord. I've been bought by God. And it's a great price that was paid to purchase me. I close with this verse in Titus chapter 2 verse 14. The Bible says, He gave himself for us that he might redeem us. That he might ransom us from every lawless deed. From every sinful deed. Every ungodly deed. That he would redeem us from sin. And purify us as a peculiar people, as his own people. You're ransomed and you're free to be his. To belong to him. So this morning, I want to ask you for your response to this Jesus Christ who said, I give my life as a ransom for many. And that many includes every single person seated here. It includes every person. What is your response to this Jesus Christ? The Bible requires an action. It requires each one of us to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. To embrace him as our Lord and Savior. Because there is no other option. And none of us can save our own selves. 
The Bible requires this, that we must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It means you tell him, Lord Jesus, I understood what you did for me. I understood the meaning of this death and resurrection. So today, seated here in this auditorium, I am making a choice to come onto your side. I'm making a choice to have you as my Lord and Savior. I'm denouncing Satan and I'm pledging allegiance to Jesus Christ. Everyone here can make that choice. If you've never done this before, if you're not sure whether you belong to Jesus Christ or not, if you've never done this before, then I want to lead you in a prayer to help you make that decision, to help you make that choice so that you can receive for yourself the ransom that Jesus paid for every person. He gave his own life as a ransom. Could we take a moment, please, just to bow our heads in prayer. I want to lead us in a simple prayer this morning. If there is even one person in this auditorium. And you've never received this ransom for yourself. I'm not talking about your neighbor. But I'm talking about you. If you have never received for yourself this ransom. This free gift that God is offering. Nothing for you to pay. All you have to do is receive it. But if you'd love to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior this morning. I want to help you pray a simple prayer. And let it happen in your life. If you've never done this before. Or if you feel you've wandered away from God. And this morning you just want to come back to your first love. Then pray this prayer with me. Please. Just say this with me. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me and that you rose up again, that you're alive. I believe you gave your life as a ransom for me. I want to be free. I receive you as my Lord, as my Savior. Help me to follow you and you alone the rest of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.